Welcome everybody who's with us here this morning. I may be looking at the camera, so forgive me if I'm not looking directly at you. Just want to uh, say welcome you to the eighth episode of Treasures from the Rabbi's Library. And this episode is sponsored by Myrtle Sitowitz in memory of her best friend and twin sister, Rene Goldstein, Rivka Baschaim Yaakov, Alea Shalom. Unfortunately, she died a few weeks ago. Here in California, Myrtle is a member of our shul, a very valued member, not only of our shul, but of our community, and uh, our condolences go out to her. So, quite a number of you have been in touch with me, you know, with special requests for treasures from the Rabbi's Library. Quite a number of you have been in touch with me, asking me if I can share with you specific treasures that you know that I have and I'm just going to share one of those with you today. And many of you of course are familiar with my book Mavericks, Mystics and False Messiahs Episodes from the Margins of Jewish History. I seem to become very well known for being familiar and uh, for being uh, um, an expert on the margins of Jewish history and one of the episodes that I wrote quite extensively about in that book was the story, the very sad uh, disagreement, debate, polemic, whatever you're going to call it, between Rabbi Yaakov Emden and Rabbi Yonas and Eberschitz. And it was an epic disagreement, an epic debate, an epic polemic, one that split the community in Hamburg. Uh, in those days, the Hamburg community was made up of three separate communities, Hamburg, Altona and Wandsbeck, which today form part of the center of, of the city, the modern city of Hamburg. At that time, part of the city fell under the jurisdiction of the Danish king of Denmark, and uh, the rest was its own uh, vicinity, its, its own district. But in any event, Rabbi Yaakov Emden lived in, uh, in that uh, triumvirate, I don't know what to call it, there was the triple city, Ahu, as it was referred to in Hebrew, Aleph, Hei, Vav, and the rabbi of the city from, 18, from 1750 was Rabbi Yonas Nebuchitz, who was an A-lister rabbi, he was the star rabbi of that period of the middle of the 18th century. He was accused in 1751, it wasn't the first time, it was uh, the first time he was accused of anything was in 1725. He was accused of being a follower of Shabtai Tzvi, whatever that could mean so many years. Don't forget Shabtai Tzvi died in 1676. But he was accused of being a follower of Shabtai Tzvi and of uh, trying to perpetuate the Kabbalistic ideas of Shabtai Tzvi. How was he caught? Because as a Kabbalist, his um, amulets, his handwritten amulets, were sought by people who were suffering from sickness, particularly by pregnant women who were concerned that they wouldn't make it through pregnancy or that they would die in childbirth or that their children would die. And his amulets were considered to be very helpful and he would give them amulets which they would wear during the course of their pregnancy and through their childbirth. Now, when these amulets were opened up, it was claimed that certain Kabbalistic charms, um, that means the letters that were written in the Kabbalistic formula, were written in such a way as to indicate that whoever authored those amulets was a follower of Shabtai Tzvi. Shocking! Rabbi Yonis Nebeshitz. He was the God Lador. He was one of the greatest rabbis of his day. He had students, great rabbis, all over Europe. People admired him for his Torah knowledge. He was an incredible speaker. Somebody could speak for three, four, five hours and captivate audiences with his breadth and depth of Torah knowledge and his brilliant delivery. The man was a teacher 
He was a rabbi. He was a communal leader. He had relationships with the Gentiles. How is it possible that this man was a heretic? And yet, Rabbi Yaakov Emden, a famous shachris, one morning, he had a private shul in his home, it was in February 1751, announced to his community that he doesn't know who the author of these amulets is. However, whoever that author is, is a follower of Shabtai Tzvi. All hell broke loose. For more details, read that particular chapter in my book. It's a very detailed account, and if you read the afterword in my book, you will see all the different sources that I used in order to arrive at the particular form of the narrative. I try to say as neutral as possible without taking sides between Rabbi Yaakov Emden, who was himself an incredibly great rabbi, somebody who came from a rabbinic family with also a breadth and depth of knowledge in Judaism and in Talmud, etc. So I did not take sides in my uh, retelling of the story. However, the details are sad. Now, one of the key books that was published during this particular debate, this particular argument, this controversy, was a book by Rabbi Yonas Nebuchitz. Now, you have to understand, Rabbi Yonas Nebuchitz was born in 1690. The year is now 1755. That means he's 65 years old, he's retirement age. He has never published a book in his life. And although he did publish one book before he died in 1763, Crazy or Placy, all the other books that we have from Rabionis and Eberschitz, and we have many, not least of which is one of the best Drush Svarim ever published in two volumes, Ya'aris Dvash. If you don't have it yet, go out and buy it. It is a most fabulous collection of Drushes that were given by Rabionis and Eberschitz during his period, particularly in Metz, when he was the rabbi in Metz from 1741 until 1750. A, a quite a remarkable collection of Drushas. The man's knowledge and his ability to interpret and put things together is beyond excellent. But that wasn't published in his lifetime. That was taken from his notes and from the notes that were taken by his students during his Drushas and was put together and published after his death. The first book he ever published was a book which was in response to the terrible accusations that were leveled against him with regard to his being a Shabtai, a Shabsoi, a follower of Shabtai Tzvi. I have a first edition of that book. It's called Luchas Edus. Here it is. Carly says I have to leave it up to the camera for a little longer than I'm doing so that when she... Uh, does the film for YouTube that people can see it. Sefer Luchas Edus, Edus Vechukim U Mishpatim, Rabbi Yonas and Eberschitz, published in Altona, a book, and it's on strong, beautiful paper, not like some of the books I have to say that Yaakov Emden published, where the paper is not great. This was obviously, they put a lot of money into this publication. Actually, my copy is the copy of Shlomo Dubno. Can you see that here? His name, Shlomo Dubno. Shlomo Dubno, Solomon Dubno, is an interesting man. We'll get to Rabionis Nebuchitz in a minute. Shlomo Dubno, Solomon Dubno, was born in Dubno, which is today in the Ukraine. And he became a very great friend of Moses Mendelssohn. And in fact, he helped him write his parish, the Biur, on the Chumish, which later became so controversial. Later on, he left Berlin, where Moses Mendelssohn lived. He went back to Eastern Europe. Eventually, he settled in Amsterdam, where he was extremely poor. The only thing he had, which he would never part with, was his library of rare books. Apparently, he had about 2,000 rare books, which he'd collected over many, many years. He lived in total penury. He's, he was so poor, he couldn't afford to put bread on the table. But he had these books... He also had a collection, an incredible collection of manuscripts. 
it would appear that I own one of the books that was owned by Solomon Dubno. I can't tell you how it made its way uh, over the century since he died. He died in the early 1800s. I can't tell you how it made its way to me here in Beverly Hills, California. But here you have, I just showed you his name, his handwritten name here on the title page of this book, Lucas Edus, the defensive book published by Rabionis and Abishitz during this um, incredible battle that he had, epic battle with Rabbi of Emden. Now I have to tell you, if you read the book, you discover, you know that um, Rabbi of Emden was actually acting by proxy because the main opponent of Rabbi Ernest Nebuchadnezzar wasn't Rabbi Yaakov Emden. It was a man called Rabbi Yaakov Yehoshua Falk. He is best known by his publication, the Pnei Yehoshua. The Pnei Yehoshua, Rabbi Yaakov, Yehuda Falk, uh, Yaakov Yehoshua Falk, was the Rav of Frankfurt am Main, which was the other principal community in Germany. Uh, in those days, Berlin was not yet at the center of Jewish life as it would later become. Berlin was in Prussia. Hamburg and Frankfurt, these were the two principal communities of Germany. And the rabbis of these two communities very often were the two most important rabbis of the Jewish world in Europe at that time. The rabbi of Frankfurt, the elderly rabbi of Frankfurt, who I would say was the absolute Godel Hador, who had Talmidim all over Europe, was Rabbi Yaakov Yehoshua Falk, the Pnei Yehoshua. He considered Rabbi Yonis and Ebershitz to be at least suspect, but most probably he thought of him as a Shapsoi. Why he thought that, we can, you can look at my book and you'll see it in greater detail, but he was convinced of it. And this book, Luchas Edus, is not written so much as a book against Rabbi Yaakov Emden. Rabbi Yaakov Emden's mentioned cursorily, often uh, with a remez. He's not even mentioned by name. It talks about Adas Yaakov, or it's, it's some kind of, you know, hint at Rabbi Yaakov Emden. He's mentioned once or twice. However, the main object of this book was to prove to the Pani Yehoshua that Rabbi Yonis and Ebershitz was right to refuse uh, the... Uh, to, ag to agree to a zablo. What's a zablo? A zablo is that occasionally, in order to reach an arbitration settlement, you have something called a zablo. Ze bore lo echod. The ze bore lo echod. And one person on one side of the dispute chooses, chooses a judge. The other person chooses, chooses another judge. And those two judges choose a third judge. Sometimes... They choose two and two, and those four choose a fifth judge. But whatever the case may be, that is considered to be an equitable, a, a, um, a fair way of judging an arbitration because you have representation from both sides of the fence and somebody who can act as a machlit, somebody who can be decisive to see which side is more correct. Rabbi Yaakov Yehoshua Falk had demanded that Rabbi Yonis Nebuchadnezzar submit himself to a zablo, and Rabbi Yonis Nebuchadnezzar had refused. This book is really written as a defensive tract to demonstrate why he was correct not to allow himself to be subjected to a zablo arbitration because it would, it would not be a, a fair way of dealing with this controversy. Now, uh, Rabbi Yaakov Yoshua Falk who was this primary rabbinic figure, was he exerted influence well beyond his own sphere. Nevertheless, Rabbi Yonis Nebuchadnezzar was also considered, as I said, an A-lister. He was an absolute star of the rabbinate in Europe at that time. Everybody knew him and had heard of him. They, if they'd not come across him personally, they'd come across one of his Talmidim, and he, his, uh, his reputation was stellar, absolutely incredible. And therefore, Rabbi Yonis Nebuchadnezzar, after he, he writes a long introduction explaining the whole situation according to his point of view, uh, I'm not going to go into those details because I don't want to, as I said, be in any way subjective or partisan, but definitely it's presented purely from his point of view, as, by the way, Rabbi Yaakov Emden's position is always presented purely from his point of view. 
But Rabbi Yonis and Eberschitz is not presenting us with an objective storyline as to what happened. But in any event, what he did do was he solicited the support of rabbis from all over Europe, including the support of a very young but up-and-coming star of the rabbinate, a man called Rabbi Yohu Kramer of Vilna. Rabbi Yohu Kramer is known to us as the Vilna Gon, and in 1755 he was 35 years old, a very young man. I just told you that Rionis and Eberschitz was 65 years old, and yet he sought the support of this young, up-and-coming rabbi in Vilna because he felt that that support would be meaningful. I'm now going to turn to the page and we're going to reproduce it in the video as well. You can see there the letter from the Vilna Gon reproduced here in Rebionis and Eberschitz's book, Luchas Edus. So he says, and in the same way, Shalachti Perushi de Kameas, I sent by explanation of the amulets, Lekila Kadosha Vilna, to the Vilna community. Because I heard specifically that among the great scholars of the city, Yesh Echod Meyuchud, there is somebody who is superlative, who is extraordinary, who is special. Hechosid Kadosh Vatohir. This is Rabbi Yonis and Eberschitz, who is 30 years older than Rabbi Yohu of Vilna, the Vilna Gon, writing about the Vilna Gon in 1755. Echosid Kadosh the righteous one, uh, holy and pure, Ma'or Yisrael, who lights up the Jewish nation. Kolu Kola he has got every type of scholarship. Chorif, he's sharp, Boki, he's a genius. Uh, he has ten hands, as it were. It's just an expression, Hebrew expression, to say he has complete and utter mastery of Nistar, which is Kabbalah. Rabbi Elijah, Eliyahu of Vilna, whose greatness is known all across Poland, over Berlin, and in Berlin, Velissa, and in Lissa, Mekoim She'ovar Echosid now because he went to visit those places, and wherever he went to visit, people acknowledged and agreed that this is one of the great rabbis of our generation. Yisapru Mimenu Gedulois, they say great things about him. He is an extraordinary personality. What's clear here, of course, is that Rabbi Yonis Nebuchadnezzar had never met him. He's only speaking about him by reputation. He's heard of the Vilna Gon and he wants to say what, uh, what he's heard about him. Uvikashti Mimenu. I requested from him, La'ayin Bepeirushim, to look into my explanations of the amulets. Velitain Eidusoi Tikinim Heim. To give his opinion, his testimony that they are absolutely fine. In other words, I sought his support, I sought his, um, his uh, testimony that everything that I have said about the amulets is correct and that my explanation of them, that they aren't indicative of my Shabbatian leanings, is correct and that Rabbi Yaakov Emden's interpretations are wrong. That is what he sought from him. Now, so you would expect that if Rabbi Yonis and Eberschitz makes that request, of this junior rabbi in Vilna, that the letter he's going to reproduce is going to be absolutely full of not only praise for him, but complete and unequivocal support. And in fact, what you'd also imagine is if the letter from the Vilna Gon is not fully in support of Rabbi Yonis Nebuchadnezzar, that he wouldn't produce it in his book. But clearly the Vilna Gon was so great that including a letter from him in his book was so important that even if it wasn't unequivocal, it was worth reproducing it simply for the fact that he'd responded to him and hadn't, um, and hadn't agreed with Rabbi Yaakov Emden. This is what he says. He, sp he's, he responds as follows. Yossis kegiboy lorutz oirach. It's a beautiful Melitzedika introduction. Meshorim batoira v'yira, etc., etc., Hagon Amiti Amufursim Chorif Uboki, similar titles that Rabbi Yonison had given him, Rabbi Yor Vilna gives to Rabbi Yonison. And we're talking about Koid Kedusha Shemoy No Eloi, 
This is the response of the Vilna Gaon to Rabbi Yonas and Ebershitz. Higani Michtav Pituche Choysom. I received your letter with all the explanations, etc. Sholach Perushim Amitiim. You sent me the true explanations. Al Heikameos de Metz on the five amulets from the city of Metz. By the way, those were the controversial amulets. Again, if you read my book, it will all become clear as to what we're talking about. Asher Yesoidoisom Baharare Kodesh. I know that their Yesoid, uh, their fundamentals are in the holy mountains. Ubikesh Mimenu Ayin Boy. And you requested of me that I look into it. In other words, the explanations that you have proffered, that you have uh, suggested for these amulets. Im Yeshorim Haim. If they are indeed Yoshar, are they straight? Are they correct? And you clearly went to great um, lengths and put yourself out because of the great suffering that you are undergoing at the moment. Um, And you are letting the public know about your great suffering as a result of the accusations against you. Why would you ask me? I'm, I'm now, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to not translate, but to just give you a general understanding of what he's saying. Why would you suggest that me, humble me, would be able to calm this fire down? This terrible controversy, this fire of controversy that is raging around you. No such thing as a machlokus, which is a good thing. It's not, it's not appropriate. But here comes the killer line. The Vilna Gaon is not willing to look at Rabbi Yonas and Ebershitz's explanations, and he explains why. Mi onoichi me'eretz merchok. Who am I from some distant land? She'yishmu ulekoil divrei devorei to listen to your words, lahatstik atzadik, to make the one who is righteous righteous. In other words, you're a great rabbi. You live where you live. I live where I live. Who am I to start interfering by looking at your explanations and trying to make sense of them and to offer my opinion as if it makes any difference? Um, uh, uh, I can't read this word. In other words, if I interfere and they're not going to listen to me, what difference does it make? If I, I, and if I am going to say something that everyone else is going to say, what difference does it make? In other words, I'm not giving you my opinion. I am not going to be drawn into this dispute between... Your interpretation of the Kameas and Rabbi Yaakov Emden's interpretation. Please judge me favorably. And because of the many, um, many things that I need to do and, and the, uh, the weight of the work that I'm involved in. It wasn't possible possible for me to organize everything karoi as it should be. Vuchrachti lekatzer, and I have to therefore um, summarize. I have to uh, make it short. Batuach ani barav anvasanusoi betzidkosoi she she so she yedoneni lechavschus that you will judge me favorably. I judge you as a. I believe that you are a humble man and a great man. You will judge me favorably for not having involved myself in this dispute. So the Vilna Gaon very delicately and very skillfully avoids getting involved in the dispute between Rabbi Yaakov Emden and Rabbi Yonas Nebeshitz. He says the nicest things about Rabbi Yonas Nebeshitz without committing to, him, uh, to Rabbi Yonas as to whether he believes the Kameas are or are not appropriate. He says, I haven't even really looked at them. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. He's saying, I don't want to get involved. Such was the influence of the Vilna Gaon 
that despite the fact that he evades any opinion and refuses to get involved, the letter is reproduced in this Sefer. This is the original Sefer, Luchas Edus, the defensive book published by Rabionis and Eberschitz in 1755. Now, some weeks ago, um, a friend of mine told me that he's reading a book by a fellow called Avram Adler. Who's Avram Adler? I'm not quite sure who he is. I know he was born in 1904 and that he died in 1967 and that he was a Hebrew writer who originated in Galicia in Poland and that his family were Belze Hasidim. And uh, by the time he got to Eretz Yisrael, I do not believe he was a religious man. Certainly he was clean shaven. He was probably traditional and he, was, he had a lot of um, fond feelings towards his upbringing and particularly towards bells. And he wrote a book and the book is Here's my copy. It's actually, it wasn't made out to me, but it has a, an inscription in it from the author. And the book is a book in Hebrew published in 1961. It's a book about his recollections of bells. It was one of the very first books that was written about the Belzer Rebbe after he died. Rabbi Arla Belza, who miraculously escaped from the Nazi inferno, from the Holocaust. He was stuck in Bochnia ghetto and he made his way to Budapest, from Budapest via Istanbul and then Syria. And he came to Eretz Yisrael in February 1944 together with his brother, Reb Mordechai Bilgarai, whose son is the present day Belzer Rebbe. Now, this book was extraordinary because it was a first-hand witness from someone who was one of the very first people to uh, be with the Belzer Rebbe when he came to Eretz Yisrael and who knew the Belzer Rebbe when the Belzer Rebbe had lived in Poland. And he gave over the whole history of how Rabbi Arla Belzer, who was so different to his father, Bisocha Ber, his father was this mighty, as he describes him in this book, a mighty, powerful figure, a vehement anti-Zionist, somebody who fought um, battles with the irreligious in Poland. And he had a son, Reb Arla, who was physically so different to him. He was a very small man, very uh, um, humble, very quiet and very loving to everybody, and certainly not combative in any way. One of the stories he tells in this book is that when Rabbi Arla Belza became the Belzer Rebbe after his father died, one of the first things he did is he went to one of the local shuls in Belz, who had had a terrible dispute with his father, and he davened there one Shabbos, and he didn't, wouldn't sit at the front. He sat among all the other um, people who were in the shul, the congregants, they gave him maftir and he davened musuf simply to, so that peace should reign in the city or in the town of Bells. In any event, this book is not a well-known book, but you can buy it. It's available. Um, and if you want to, you can look it up. I'm sure you can find it somewhere. It's a book that is available for 40, 50 shekel in most good second-hand bookshops in Eretz Yisrael. What is less well known is that there was somebody in Eretz Yisrael called Tamari, a man called Tamari, who was very taken by this book, and therefore he decided he was going to translate it into English. I don't know how I got this book. Here it is. It's called The Righteous Man and the Holy City, Aaron of Bell's Stories of Jerusalem by Abraham Adler, and there's a translator's preface M. Tamari, and it's a translation of the book. It's slightly longer. You know that Hebrew is a much, uh, to write it out, is a much shorter language than English. So that book, I think, is about 200 pages. This is uh, 339, 344 pages. The thing about this book is, it was published in Eretz Yisrael by something called the Jerusalem Library. I don't even know who that is. It's an extremely rare book, as it turns out. So much so is that a few weeks ago, a friend of mine said to me, have you, have you ever read the book by Adler about bells? I said, of course I've read it. I have it. I, not only that, I have an English translation of the book. He said, really? Can you find it? 
That was a few weeks ago. It's taken me a few weeks to find it. And here it is. Anyway, last night I checked it out. And there's not, there's only one of them that's available on the internet if you wanted to buy it. And it's available for $1,500. So between 40 to 50 shekel or $1,500 is the difference in value between the original Hebrew book and the English translation. This one was published in 19, I think also 1961 or 62. It doesn't say here, which is unusual. But in any event, what I really need to do is to have this book scanned so that I can make it available for everybody and uh, post a scan onto my website. One of those uh, projects which is still, which still needs to get into hand. Now, I told you uh, a couple of weeks ago that I love collecting curiosities and this is one of those curiosities. It's a book, an interesting book. It's, uh, I don't know what to call it, it's like a pamphlet. It's a pamphlet by Professor Avraham Hachman. Who is Avraham Hachman? I don't really know. I mean, there's articles about him. I have a number of articles. Here's one which was published in 2015, The Hidden World of Tenement Fortune Tellers. Tenement Fortune Tellers, do you hear that? Tenement Fortune Tellers were people who lived on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, and they were, you know, they could be Nerebus, they could be just card readers, tarot card readers. Whoever they were, there were people who were desperate and who were looking for some kind of help, and they would come and they would give their 25 cents, and the fellow would tell them, you know, their fortune, and things would hopefully go okay. This guy, Hoch Hochman, Professor Avram Hochman, I have to tell you, I did try and look him up to see if we could find out anything more about him. He disappears after about the year 1910. So he was uh, wearing very interesting clothes. There were a bunch of medals. Don't know exactly what they are. Professor Hochman, it says in my book, in the back of my booklet... I'm going to show you the page. Professor Hochman, you looking here? Sorry, it's a bit tatty, the book. Professor Hochman from Rivington Street in New York City. If you wish to eliminate trouble, avoid difficulties and be on the road to success, consult the great world-renowned palmist. He's a palm reader, a mind reader, so much talked about in the newspapers. He discloses your name, the name of the individual you are thinking about, traces your life from cradle to grave, advises you on all matters pertaining to business, marriage, love affairs, matrimonial disagreements, travel, travels, letters, etc. And he can be consulted at his office, 169 Rivington Street, for the last 19 years. Readings for 50 cents and one dollar. A lot of money for people living in the tenements in those days. The professor, one wonders where he had a professor's chair, in which university, that's not clear, recently published a book helpful to all called The Book of the Mystery of Astrology, which will be sent upon application for the sum of 25 cents post paid. With each book, a coupon will be sent, which on being returned to me with your questions will be good for 25 cents. Professor Avram Hochman operated until around the year 1910 when this little book was published. Now, what is this book? It's a very interesting book. It is a book which is a um, calendar for 100 years between 1860 and 1959. I'm just going to show you a page. We don't need to show this on the video more than this. You can see that. It basically has all the dates of the year with years in it, and it can tell you which day of the week a particular date will fall on. And it's worked, and it's very cleverly done. And he, what he's done is, is he's, he's created it in such a way, like it's tables, so that if you're trying to work out what day of the week a particular date will be, or was, in some previous year, let's say it's now 1910, you want to know when the 5th of June was in 1875. You can look in this and by using a certain system, you can tell that the 5th of June, 1875, 
was a Tuesday. Or if you want to know in 1910, when is the 5th of June going to be? In 1935, you can look at this book and using these tables, it will tell you how to do it. So it's an intriguing book. It's written partly in Yiddish, partly in English and partly in Hochdeutsch, in German. Just a curiosity. I found, I've, and there's a number of articles about Professor Abraham Hochman on the internet. I would be fascinated to know if anyone has ever researched him to find out what happened to him after 1910. I have no records of him after then. I know that he was active in the 1890s and the early part of the 20th century on the Lower East Side of New York. But what happened to him subsequently, I have absolutely no idea and would be very interested to find out. We come to another interesting uh, piece that I found some years ago. I was very intrigued by it. And I couldn't work it out. You know, sometimes you, you discover something and it's intriguing and it's interesting, but you just can't work out the details. I'm going to share it with you now because this is a bit of a quest. It's one of, it's one of my quests to find background information about something that doesn't make much sense. The book is called Haget Mi Tel Aviv. The Divorce from Tel Aviv. Written by a man called Rabbi Abram Modcha Halevi Horovitz. This is the title page. And it's a very interesting story. I'm going to share the story with you before I tell you a little bit more about the author. Although partly it's going to be about the author uh, to understand the content of the book. But we need to understand where the author is coming from. So the author, this Avram Modcha Halevi Horovitz, was an elderly widower. His wife had died. I would think, although I don't have any evidence of this, that he was born in around the year 1900. The reason I say this is because I know that he died in 1985. I have a picture of his grave on Harazesim, and it says that he died in Tofshian Memhe. His name was Avram Modcha Levi Horvitz Ben Harav Hagon Echosid Yehuda Nochum Leibish. Okay. So he died in, in that year, and that means he was probably born around 85 years earlier. So this book was published in 1960-ish. Um, I have it here as published actually 1963. He wanted to remarry. He meets a woman called Chana, and this Chana is a divorcee, so obviously... He wants to make sure that if he marries her, that the get is 100% in order. So he says, please show me the correspondence regarding your get. Now, if you know anything about getting, you know that as a woman who receives a get, you, you initially receive it in the Beisdim, but then you give it back to the Dayonim, and they actually destroy it, and they give you a letter to say that the get has been received, and that letter is your proof that you are a Magureshes, that you were divorced according to Jewish law. So she had um, received her get, I believe in 1949, in the Beisdin of Tel Aviv. Who was the Rosh Beisdin in those days? The chief rabbi of Tel Aviv was a man called Rabbi Isser Yehuda Unterman. He later became the chief rabbi of Israel after the passing of Rabbi Yitzhak Isaac Herzog, who we spoke about last week with his grandson. And Rabbi Yitzhak Isaac Herzog died in 1959. And in 1962, I believe, Rabbi Issa Yehuda Unterman became the chief rabbi of Israel for 10 years. He was a Talmud of Rabbi Shimon Shkop. Before moving to Eretz Yisrael, around the time of the end of the Second World War, he was the chief rabbi of Liverpool in England. Liverpool is not far away from Manchester. And he was considered one of the great rabbis of Great Britain, of the United Kingdom. Then he moved to Eretz Yisrael. He was very active in the Mizrahi, already in the UK. And when he came to Eretz Yisrael, he had an epic battle to become the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv after the passing of Rabbi Amiel. His interlocutor, the person who was also vying for the position of chief rabbi of Tel Aviv in 1946, was none other than Raburachal Rabinovich, who was the uh, previous 
or had been the rabbi of Munkach, who was the Munkach Rebbe. He'd moved to Eretz Yisrael, he'd arrived there in 1944, and he wanted to be the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, but he lost out to Rabbi Unterman, and this get had taken place in 1949. So, not entirely satisfied with the letter that he saw from um, the, uh, the Tel Aviv based in, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Avram Modcha Horovitz decided he wanted to see for himself the full file relating to this get. He went to Tel Aviv, he lived in Yerushalayim, he went to Tel Aviv and he requested to see the file and they showed him the file and he found what he considered to be a fatal discrepancy. The husband who had um, given permission to the Beisdin to act as his shaliach to order the get to be written had given over the name as Chana. But actually her name had only, it seems, become Chana when she moved to Eretz Yisrael and before that she was known as Anna. And Rabbi Horovitz felt that it was entirely inappropriate that the letter of instruction from the husband contained the wrong name because they had acted on a phony instruction and therefore the get when it was written wasn't really written under the instruction or by the instruction of the husband in which makes the get possible. Therefore he challenged the Tel Aviv based in particularly Rabbi Unterman, to um, explain themselves as to how it's possible that they allowed such a discrepancy to creep into their divorce process because now this poor woman can't remarry until she receives another get from her ex-husband. Or not really ex-husband. This developed into a, um, what I can say is a vigorous correspondence between Rav Horovitz. Here's a picture of Rav Horovitz, by the way. Here's a picture of Rav Horovitz, who was a Polish rabbi who lived in Yerushalayim. He was a Dayan and a, in a Beisdim. We're going to get to that. And he challenged Rabbi Unterman. Rabbi Unterman reacted very angrily to his challenge. But he wrote a long teshuva, and that's what this book contains, a long teshuva to explain why the get, and by the way, the copy that I have, I don't know if every copy is like this, the copy I have has handwritten notes, if you can see them there on the, on the margins, handwritten notes from uh, Rabbi Horovitz to, uh, to augment the various things that he's saying in the teshuva that he wrote to, to Rabbi Unterman. Rabbi Unterman was having none of it. And he basically said to him, you don't know what you're talking about. We checked very closely and the husband made a mistake. He thought that because her name is Anna, but they now live in Israel, that it should be Chana, but actually her name was Anna. Whatever it was, I can assure you that Rabbi Unterman, and certainly the way he expresses it in quite an impatient way, I have to tell you, in the letter to Rabbi Horovitz is, he checked into this and was entirely satisfied that the get was, um, was put together appropriately, taking into consideration every type, type of halachic ramification, and that he was simply nitpicking for the sake of nitpicking. Okay, so this is an interesting vignette of some obscure rabbi in Yerushalayim. Now let me tell you which based in he belonged to, and that's what really got me interested. Um, because it said that he is a Dayan, just trying to find it here. He's a Dayan on a Beisdin, which is a non partisan Beisdin. Um, where does it say it here? Um, doesn't sound, I'm not finding it directly in front of me, but it said that he was a Dayan in a Beisdin, which is a Beisdin that is not considered to be a partisan Beisdin. In other words, he's not Aguda, he's not Mizrahi, he's not an anti Zionist. He is simply a rabbi, a Dayan of a non partisan Beisdin, 
in Yerushalayim. That's how he signed himself. I'm just, I want to see if I can find the exact um, explanation as to what he said. I can't, I can't find it in front of me, but uh, this, this dates back to 1959, when, um, when he first came across this woman who he wanted to marry. And by the way, I have no indication here as to whether he did or didn't marry her, or whether he managed to arrange another get. Um, I do know that he tried to involve the chief rabbi, of Israel, the Sephardic chief rabbi of Israel, in his battle with um, with the, with Rabbi Unterman, but obviously he couldn't involve. At some stage, he wasn't able to involve the Ashkenazi chief rabbi because Rabbi Unterman was the Ashkenazi chief rabbi. Um, and in any event, it's it's very inconclusive as to what exactly happened. Uh, and how exactly this was resolved, if it was resolved at all. What struck me was that he was the Dayan of a Beisdim which I'd never heard of in Yerushalayim. I'm aware of the Eide Haredes, I'm aware of the Sephardic Beisdim in Yerushalayim, I'm aware of uh, the Beisdim of the Aguda, and of course there is the, uh, um, the Jerusalem Rabbinate, and then there is the Beisdim Hagodl in, in uh, Heichel Shloimer, etc. There's, there's many Bote Din, and there's a few private Bote Din, but usually they are associated with a particular group, a particular miflaga, and this one was deliberate in that it rejected this label of uh, partisanship. Who is he? So I went to look into it and I managed to obtain two quite rare, one particularly rare, publications regarding this Abramodcha Halevi Horovitz. Who was he? He was a Talmud of Yeshiva Chachmei Lublin. His uncle or cousin, I'm not sure which, was none other than Reb Shimela Zelechova, whose name was also Horovitz, you know, as Engel or Horovitz. Reb Shimela Zelechova, I like to call him the unknown Rogachova. He was one of the most profound scholars of the pre war yeshiva world. He knew the entire Shas, Babli, Yerushalmi, Sifri, Sifra, Mechilta, Tesefta by heart, without any question whatsoever. He was a great Kabbalist. He knew Musser. He was, had a phenomenal memory. And he was one of the great educators. He became the Mashkiach Ruchani in the Yeshiva Chachmi Lublin until the passing of, of, the, uh, of Rav Shapira, Rav Meir Shapira, who was the Rosh Yeshiva. There seems to have been some dispute in the Yeshiva at that stage. And he was ousted. And he opened up his own Yeshiva in Krakow. And in fact, I have a sefer here. Where is it? Nahore Ash, which was published by his best-known Talmud. This is Nahore Ash, published by his best-known Talmud in the, in the year 2010. Who was his best-known Talmud? Bet you're thinking now you must know who his best-known Talmud was. It was none other than Yerachmiel Yisrael Yitzchak Don, who was the great Naturikatanik, one of the great publicists of the anti-Zionist movement in the post-war years. He lived in London. And he was the principal Talmud of Reb Shimla Zelichova. I don't know what his relationship with, was with, um, with Reb Avram Modcha Halevi Horovitz, who was a relative of his Rebbe. But I do know this, that in 1930, and I would think this was shortly after Avram Modcha Horovitz moved to Eretz Yisrael, he lived in Bote Varsha. Bote Varsha was the housing project that belonged to the Varsha Kolal part of the stocker, the Kodal, Reb Meir Balanes. So anybody who lived in Eretz Yisrael until a particular moment in history, if they wanted to be sustained, there wasn't enough Parnosa for them to be able to sustain themselves through, let's say, owning a store or doing business. They had to receive money from the Kupa, from the uh, Karen stocker of Reb Meir Balanes. And depending where you came from, as was where you got your money from. If you came from Poland, you got it from Koil Poland. And if you came from Galicia, you got it from Koil Galicia. If you came from Hungary, you got it from Koil um, um, uh, Hungary. So the Ungarische uh, Eiser, the Bote Ungarn, which is in Meir Sha'arim, 
that was built by this the particular um, part of Koyl, um Balanes, which gave money to those people who had come out of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, if you came from Koyl Polin in that period, in the interwar years, there was a massive change. The change was that the Ger Rebbe took over Koyl Polin and he designated where the funds should go. He raised the money, or at least he stood behind those who raised money in Poland, and then he made decisions where that money should go. In 1930, Rabbi Ramadcha Levi Horowitz, who clearly was not a Gera Chosid, wrote a book in which he suggested that the Gera Rebbe had taken over against the will of the recipients of the money in the Polish Koilo. He'd taken over Reb Meir Balanes money from Poland and was giving it to the wrong places. His implication was that money was going to Ger projects and not going to projects that, uh, or to the recipients that needed to receive the money because they were those who had uh, emigrated, immigrated from Poland. It's a, here's the book, here's the title page of the book, Kvoid Yerushalayim, um, Kvoid Yerushalayim by Rabbi Ramod Chalevi Isharovitz. At the back of the book, so most of the book is fairly obscure, but at the back of the book, he absolutely indicates that it's the Ger Rebbe who is the subject of this book and to his associates. Hine roim onu sha'api das toira seinu ha-kadosha osur lekabel ba'atzmoi hanasiyas beli rishus aniye aret ha-kodesh. It's clear, according to Torah law, that he is not entitled to accept upon himself the leadership of this particular Karen Stocker without the permission of the uh, poor people, the mendicants who live in the Holy Land. Can you hear that? He directly accuses the Rebbe of Ger of being a gazlan. They've taken control for themselves over the people who require money who live in the Holy Land. Against the will, against the desire of those who live in Eretz Yisrael. And he goes now into a particular Psak Din in which he quotes, among others, Rab Tzvi Pesach Frank. There's other quotations in here, one of them from Rab Issa Zalma Meltzer. And this Avram Ad Chahorovitz took on, he was not somebody with 100,000 Hasidim. The Ger Rebbe had 100,000 Hasidim. He didn't have 100,000 Hasidim, he was a rabbi who was related to a rabbi from Yeshiva Chachmi Lublin, who now moved to Eretz Yisrael. In essence, when you have a fight, even if you're right, you need to calculate politically how successful you're going to be in taking on your opponent before you take on your opponent. He was singularly unsuccessful. And by the way, this book, it's impossible to find. I don't know how much it's worth. I've never checked. I've never seen another copy. I'm not even sure if it's available on Hebrew books. I didn't check. I know that it's extremely rare, and there's a reason for it, because of this book. This book came, called Mitzio in Yerushalayim, also in 1930. It was a book by Rabbi Ari Modcha Rabinovich, who was a Rav in Bnei Brak, and he was a Gera Chosid. He later moved to Yerushalayim. Rabbi Ari Modcha Rabinovich writes in the book here, without any question, that it is Osur, to have this book in your house. You're not allowed to bring this abomination book into your home according to the halachic ruling of the rabbis in Israel. So much so, there was absolute unanimity on this that Rabbi Avram Madcha Horovitz's book was totally unacceptable that Rabbi Avram Yitzhak HaKoyen Kuk and Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonnenfeld signed letters side by side in the book. That's how much they both held of the Ger Rebbe 
That's another story as well, that Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld had had a whole story with the Ger Rebbe when he'd come to visit and had had an audience with Rav Kook. But I've said that in a separate uh, talk that I've given in the past. In any event, he certainly was not interested in getting into battle with the Ger Rebbe. Rabbi Avram Yitzhak HaKohen Kook held the Ger Rebbe in very high esteem. Now, if you're Rabbi Avram Modcha, Halevi Horvitz, which camp do you belong to? You don't belong to the Aguda Kanoi camp, that was the camp of uh, the old Yishuv in Eretz Yisrael, because that's Rabbi Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld. You don't belong to the Zionist camp, the pro-Zionist, the pro-State of Israel creation camp of Rav Kook. You fall somewhere in the middle, as a result of which, here's a letter from Rav Tzvi Pesach Frank and Rav Berenstein, both from the Yerushalayim Bezden, Rabbi Yaakov Moshe Chalap, he was the Talmud Muvik, of, of, the, uh, of Rav Kook. Then you have a letter here from um, Rav Issa Zalman Meltzer, Rav Moshe Clears, I can see here a letter, etc., etc. As a result of which, the only choice that Rav Avramod Chahorovitz had was to open his own based in, which was not from any miflaga. He wasn't doing so because that's what he wanted to do. He was doing so because he had no choice but to do that. Sadly enough, he burnt his bridges almost as soon as he came to Eretz Yisrael. And by the time he got to getting remarried in 1960, whatever it was, and he was going into battle with Rav Unterman, he had no backers. He wasn't involved with the Aguda. He wasn't involved with the Kanoim of the Eide Charedes. He wasn't involved with the Zionist Rabbanut. He had nothing but a little pamphlet that he could publish. He had sunk without trace. And again, if anybody has any further information about Rabbi Avram Modcha Levi Horvitz, as you know, I am an information junkie. I'm always interested in learning something new. And whatever I know, I'm always interested in learning more. So I thank you so much for joining me on this wonderful uh, tour through a few of the treasures from my library. And I look forward to welcoming you back to my library next week when I'm sure that I'll have much more to reveal again. All the best. Thank you so much for being with me.